So thank you for being here today on The Battles Within as we continue in our series of Who is Jesus? This is session number seven. Hopefully today we'll be concluding our Jesus the early years and uh, we can start diving into a little more with the start of his ministry. Before we get started, we want to have a word of prayer. So let's pray. Lord, I'm so thankful for the opportunities that you give us to study your word I'm thankful, Lord, that uh, you show us in your word who you are, that we can learn from you by studying your word. I pray, Lord, you help each of us get into your word and be able to understand it better so that we can then share it with others. For, Lord, we recognize there are souls going to hell today because of our laziness, because of our slothfulness, not doing what we need to be doing. I pray, Lord, you convict each of us, myself included, that we be busy about your business and not so much minding other people's business. I, th you know, I thank you, Lord, for all you do for us. Help us with this lesson. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you so much again for your time. Today we're going to be uh, covering this uh, messages today. We're excited uh, to, to share with you the um, uh, latter part. I'm just trying to get my mess set up here so I can see myself. Okay, and we're going to get started with that. So the first thing we want to talk about is, just as a little bit of introductory, Luke 2, 39, 40, you've heard me read it a number of times. I'm going to read it again. Uh, it says, Luke says, And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and with the grace of God was upon him. So today we're going to continue this historical line in the life of Jesus. We're going to cover the first nine to ten years of his life before his temple experience. So from you know last week we had covered uh, certain parts of the story, and now we're going to finish it up through hopefully through his all of his adolescence and his youth. Now we're reminded that the story of Jesus in the Bible is very limited of his early years. Because remember, the purpose of the Bible was not to show us necessarily um, who he was, who Jesus is in his early life, but really who Jesus is as in relationship to what he did for us throughout his life. John told us, again, that there was too much in the Bible to cover all the things that Jesus did. John 21, 25, again, as we read it in the past. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, everyone, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. So clearly the objective of writing the scripture about Jesus was not to give us a biography of his life, but was to give us the information that God needed us to know about him so that we could know him and who he is and what he did for us. So we know that for sure. So the very purpose of everything that was written about Jesus in his word was recorded for the world so that we could know what we need to know for salvation and the Christian way. So, now, having said that, let's jump into today's material. So, what happened during those nine or ten years of Jesus' youth uh, before his trip to the temple at 12 years old? You know, uh, when we left him last, he had just gone into uh, Nazareth. They had just settled back in Nazareth because they fled. They went after the wise men left, as you remember, and Herod was seeking the life, the warned by an angel, they got up in the middle of the night and went to Egypt. Well, after, uh, Herod, after Herod died, the angel again appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, go back, come back home now, because those who seek your life are dead. So when he came back home, then uh, the son of Pharaoh, son of, 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 of Herod was... Um, on the throne, and, he, and Joseph feared him, and being warned, left and went back to Nazareth. So no doubt he came back to Bethlehem when he left, and there he went back to Nazareth. Nazareth being a small Gentile 
a Gentile region, and Nazareth being one of the smallest areas. And remember we talked about last week about him being called a Nazarite or Nazarene was a reflection of the community that he was lower than the lowest. Okay? He was growing up in a region where there was little respect to people who were in that region. And that's what God wanted. God wanted to show that Jesus was going to take on the lowliest form he could of a man to come and save us. So now, what happened between then and him going to the temple? That's where we are. So Luke, interesting enough, Luke skipped all of the stuff concerning Herod and his trip to Egypt and simply states that they returned to Galilee. Now, the reason why that is is because, remember, Luke is primarily writing to Gentiles. And the Gentiles people probably would not have understood the situation, or at least they would not have grasped the importance of the situation that took place with the wise men. They were not as concerned about him being king of the Jews as they were being savior of the world. And so Luke kind of skips over that and points them to that Jesus grew up in a Gentile city in Galilee. This uh, uh, clearly can make them uh, connect with Jesus. You know, uh, that he simply points this prominent, prominent Gentile audience to Nazareth and made them one of them, that made Jesus one of them, a boy growing up in a Gentile city. He was one of their own. Uh, we're just celebrating uh, the Olympics here uh, this year, and um, one of our uh, local heroes from a local high school in Raleigh, uh, not far from us here, uh, went to the Olympics and won a gold medal in the Olympics, and he came back home, and they celebrated him. Uh, even the people that didn't know him came and celebrated because he was one of their own, see? And so I think Luke was writing that way so that they can they could connect themselves that Jesus grew up in a Gentile city. That's important for us too. You understand, Jesus was all Jew. Yes, absolutely. But he grew up in a Gentile city. He understood us. He understood those who were not Jews because he grew up among them. Now Luke doesn't give us much uh, from the age of two or three year old until he reaches the age of 12 and simply gives us this statement. So this is one verse covers about 10 years. And Luke chapter 2 verses 40 says, And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. That one verse covers about 10 years of Jesus' life. But we can still get several things out of this. Number one, we can see that Jesus' family life. Jesus grew up in a, a bustling, growing family. Now we know Matthew makes it clear that Jesus was the only child of Joseph and Mary before Jesus was born. That there was no relationship between Jesus, I mean Joseph and Mary until after the child was born. But after the child was born, they were husband and wife, and they had children. They had a number of children. The Bible tells us that Jesus had several younger half-siblings, half children of Joseph and Mary. Uh, Matthew, matter of fact, names four of his brothers. In Matthew, fifth, uh, thir Matthew chapter 1, verses 55-56 says, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Josie and Simon and Judas and his sister? They're not all with us. And then in a passage in Mark chapter 3, it says, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? So we know for sure that Jesus had at least, that Jesus had brothers and at least two sisters. And we know Jesus was the oldest of at least seven children. At least seven children. So we know that uh, his stepfather, Joseph, was a carpenter. All this we learned during this time period, right? We learned that Joseph was a carpenter, and his occupation is generally understood that somebody that works with wood. You think of a carpenter, you think of somebody that works with wood. Well, in the uh, an expositor's Bible commentary, the word carpenter can mean a one who works with wood, but it also can mean uh, a builder. So it could be that he wasn't necessarily someone that worked with wood, 
but someone that was a builder. And, you know, builders today work with a variety of things. You know, you have people who are concrete workers. You have some people that are brick masons. You have people that are, uh, you know, a variety of different things, stucco workers. See, and, and remember now, in that day, most of the houses were not made out of wood, but were made out of mud brick. So it's possible that Jesus built houses out of mud bricks. You know, built bricks and did that. So we don't know exactly. We know he was a carpenter, but again, that term could have meant builder just as well. So we don't really know what, but we know that, that Joseph's father was a carpenter or a builder. That's how he made a living. Now, either way, we know that this uh, occupation would have required skills and patience, hard work, uh, all the traits that Jesus observed during his childhood. Let me tell you, I, I had a tree removed my house yesterday. And uh, the, uh, the name of the company is All-American Tree Service. And out of a local, out of our city, Selma nearby. And let me tell you, those guys got here about 11 o'clock. They worked like dolls all day long. I mean, they worked hard. And, and uh, I was well pleased you know, the, 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 for the money that they asked me to give them to do the work. It was well worth the money. I did not feel like I was gypped at all in that process. Very hardworking people. Well, Jesus in his car, those carpenters, Joseph, no doubt, was a hardworking man just like that who worked hard every day and taught his son, his son Jesus, you know, even though he's his stepson, right? He's his earthly father, but he grew Jesus up as his own son, of course. And as such, he learned those things. He would learn how to be a hardworking person. Now, the question is, was Jesus a carpenter? Well, Mark refers to him as a carpenter. We already saw that in chapter 6, verse 3. And uh, during Jesus' lifetime, it was customary, you know, for boys to be apprenticed, apprenticed as their father. If their father was a carpenter, their son would be a carpenter. If their father was a doctor, their son would be a doctor. Uh, if their son, father was a fisherman, there would be a fisherman. I mean, that was typically the way it was. Uh, and given that Jesus was the oldest son in the household, it seems probable that Jesus would have been trained and employed as a carpenter. Now, while the Bible does not expound upon the point that Jesus was a carpenter, uh, it is likely, think about it, it's likely that Jesus used, had to have a skill. He had to support himself and his family. I want you to look at this point here. Now, since Joseph is never mentioned again after the temple event that we're going to study today, uh, it is believed by most scholars, and I'm not a scholar per se, but I would also agree that probably Joseph had passed away during the time of this silence after, after uh, the temple visit until he started his ministry. Clearly, when he started his ministry, Joseph is nowhere to be seen. So somehow, sometime or another, from the age of 12 or 13 years of age until he reached 30 years old to begin his ministry, Joseph had passed away. That means Jesus was the head of the household, being the eldest son. That means he had to make sure that there was, a, a, that was work being done. So it's, the odds are that Jesus, since the Bible says he's the carpenter, that we assume that Jesus would have needed an occupation to support his mothers and his brothers and his sisters and, and, and during that time period. Also, he would have to eat and, and provide clothes and housing for himself during the time period before he started his ministry. So clearly, he had to have a job, and the job, no doubt, was probably being a carpenter. So we know that Jesus was probably a carpenter. We also learned that Jesus was raised in a religious home. Luke 2.41, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. They went every year to the feast. Now, the Bible shows us that Jesus was reared in a devoutly religious home. His family faithfully followed the God's instruction concerning annual religious festivals. You know, Luke records that the family, not only did they do it once in a while, they made it an annual trip to go to the, day, to the Passover and the Days of the Eleven Bread. Let me tell you, scientists today have confirmed the benefits for children growing up in religious environments. Dr. Pat Fagan is the director of the Center for Research on Marriage and Religion 
senior fellow at the Marriage and Religion Institute. In other words, somebody that's got a lot of knowledge in this area. And uh, uh, what Dr. Fagan said was that after compiling over 100 independent social scientists over the last two decades on the effect of that church attendance has on the lives of kids, made this statement. When policymakers consider Americans' grave social problems, including violent crimes and raising illegitimacy, substance abuse, and welfare dependency, they should heed the findings in the professional literature of social science on the positive consequences that flow from faithful church attendance. So some of the study, 2001 study, showed that personal religious belief and practice act as a buffer against stress and negative effects of trauma. He said in 2003, the Boston University study linked higher rates of religious service attendance and better test scores among U.S. girls in the South pointing to an emerging consensus on the generally positive role of religious practice on education. So you not only have less stress in your life if you're religious, but you also have uh, you also have a better opportunity to do better in education if you're more religious. Annette Maloney, a professor of psychology at Bowling Green University, who studies effects of religion has on family and on parenting, wrote a book entitled The Best Love of a Child, Being Loved and Being Taught to Love as the First Human Rights. And in that, in that book, she makes several statements. Uh, the benefits of religion for adolescents seem to be largely attributable to differences between the most religiously involved teens compared to those who are disengaged. So in other words, the benefits to religion is for those who are truly engaged in the religion and those who are not engaged in the religion. Inconsistent religiousness seems to bring little to no benefit at all. So in other words, if you just go to church on a regular basis, but you're really not engaged, you're really not a believer, it really doesn't benefit you. Uh, religion is not especially helpful, she said, for roughly 53% of U.S. adolescents whose faith is sporadic or poorly integrated. So in other words, you only can get the benefits of the religion of Christianity as an example that we're here today to talk about. You only get that benefit if you're engaged in, you're truly committed. So practically speaking, that means that you can push your children to go to church on Sunday or pray five times a day, but if they don't believe Going through the motions of religion won't give them any of its pro-social or developmental advantages. In other words, it makes a difference in what you believe, in who you are. If you're a Christian, we need to get our children saved. We need to get our children committed, not just attending church, but we need to work to evangelize our children. That's how they gain the benefits, because it's a change in their lives. Well, we know for sure, uh, by the way, and they go a little more, a uh, sociologist from the University of North Carolina said family members who participate in the same religious institutions are likely to have a shared set of social ties with other members of their religious institution. In other words, if your family all participates in the same religion, then the, the children grow up believing and following that religion and have the same type of commitment. Learning at an early age that there is a God and that each person is made in his image provides a healthy atmosphere for well-adjusted children. This is based on studies from a sociologist. Having said that, what does that do with Jesus? Joseph and Mary furnished a home, right? Centered on God's love, his commandments, his way of life, and is undoubtedly one reason that God selected them to provide his son's early childhood development. He chose the right environment to place his son. He chose the right parents to give Jesus to. Did God choose, listen to this, did God choose the right parents for your children? Oh, hold it. Did God choose the right parents for your children? You know, are you committed deeply to God? And then are you demonstrating that to your children 
and evangelizing your children. It is not the job of the church, of the pastor, of the youth pastor, of the Sunday school teacher to evangelize your children. It is your job to evangelize your children. I had the the I had the blessing to lead my son to the Lord while I was teaching a children's church at West Calvary. It was a great opportunity for me. I had the opportunity to lead my daughter to the Lord at nighttime when we were praying on the first on the on New Year's Eve. Uh, so the the point is I had those opportunities to lead my children to the Lord, to evangelize my children. It's my job, my duty as a parent to evangelize. Now, that doesn't mean your child can't be saved through somebody else, but that does not relieve you of the responsibility to do so, to ensure that they get it and then that they were raised right. That's what Joseph and Mary did, and they demonstrated that faith by going to these by going annually to the house to the house of the Lord. So now here we come to Jesus at the temple. Luke 2, 41 through 51. I normally would read it all at one time then go back, but we're going to study each verse verse by verse because this is important. And so I want to make this the only place in the Bible that covers this verse at, this at the temple. So we're going to cover it verse by verse and look at that, these 10 verses, these 11 verses. And so I'm just going to jump in straight to the first verse 41. Verse 41 says, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. Notice it said, went every year. We see that Mary and Joseph were both committed to serving God. Now, as we see, unfortunately, as we're seeing that uh, Afghanistan is being, was being turned back over to the Taliban, basically. And the Taliban in Afghanistan limit women's rights terribly. They're, they're forcing children to get married as young as 10 years old to older men. Uh, they uh, brutally uh, treat women. They don't allow women to go to school and learn. Uh, they make them cover their faces in public, and they, can only, they can't drive a car. It's terrible the, the atrocities that's done upon women. But in Jesus' day, women were still not seen necessarily, not treated as equal among men. I think in Mary and Joseph's life, Joseph treated Mary like he loved her and was concerned for her. And it appeared that when we saw Joseph, Joseph and Mary were together in most situations. So that was a well relevant household. Well, we see that, that Mary and Joseph both were committed to serving God. And it says that, that his parents went every year, every year to the Lord. Jewish men who live within 20 miles of Jerusalem are required to attend the Passover annually. They were required to. While others aspire to attend at least one time in their lifetime, a pilgrimage, you could say, to Jerusalem to attend the Passover at least one time in their lifetime. But now, listen, remember, the facts are here that both Jer Joseph and Mary made this trip every year shows us that their commitment of this couple in serving God. So Jesus grew up in a highly committed relationship. You know what? Are you raising your, go back to this thing again, are you raising your children? Demonstrating a commitment to the Lord. Are you talking about God daily with your children? Are you praying before you eat? Simple enough. Are you praying? Are you speaking to God? Are your children learning how to speak to God? My children know that we never, and I'm not criticizing those who do, you understand. I'm just saying my commitment, my view was I never taught my children to pray uh, little prayers. I never, uh, or, you know, written prayers. I just never did it. I never did it. I always taught my children to pray to God, just to speak to God. You know, like when it's time to eat, to bless the food, you know, we simply would say, uh, you know, um, Lord, bless this food to our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. That's all we needed, right? We're praying to God. We didn't need to do a chant. Now, if you know, you want to teach your children how to pray and you want to use those things to help them understand, I have no problem with that. When we went at nighttime, we didn't do the, now I lay me down to sleep, now I pray the Lord my soul to keep. We didn't do that. We just prayed to God. We spoke to God. That's the way I chose to demonstrate the ability to speak to God. But my point to you is, if you use that prayer, fine, but there's got to be a transition. 
You've got to transition them. I've been in adult, I've been in situations where the families and the adults pray that prayer. Now, maybe they're praying it to help their children understand. Okay, let's give, I'll give you that perhaps. But some, I think people don't know how to pray to God. Because they don't do it. I pray to God like I'm talking to you. Why? Because he's closer to me than you are. I don't want to digress on that. It's simply saying that Mary and Joseph demonstrated their knowledge, their commitment to God every day. And that's what Jesus saw here. They were deeply committed. It says they attended at the feast of the Passover. Passovers require killing of a lamb and smearing his blood on the doorpost to commemorate the passing over the death angel in Egypt. That was the Passover. Jewish males were obligated to keep these three festivals. Festivals of the Unleavened Bread, Passover. The Festival of Weeks, which is Pentecost. And the Festival of Booths, which are Tabernacles. It is, a, it is a significant journey for them to do this every year. It's a significant journey from Nazareth. It's about 60 miles straight across as the crow flies. But if you know the roads don't always go straight across. Sometimes it takes you a long time. I have I use Waze on my uh, mobile phone to, to go places. And uh, it gives me different routes. And there's all kinds of Some of the routes are faster but longer. Some of them are a lot shorter but a lot longer. It depends upon the route that you take. So, but there's 60 miles as the crow flies if you just took a pin to a run. So, how did, obviously it was even more than that because they couldn't walk in a straight line. They had to go around over hills and valleys and around mountains and stuff like that. And so, no doubt, took them to several days to travel each way in addition to a week in Jerusalem. So, you, you, you can figure this probably was about a two-week vacation. So, that means this family packed up all their gear and went to Jerusalem every year for two weeks vacation. Now, it's not clear that they took all of their family with them every year. You know, it is possible they may have left some of the children behind. I think they did it as a family pilgrimage. Uh, there's nothing that says that, but it says their parents went every year, but I would assume that they went. But either way, we know this was an expensive pilgrimage. Verse 42 says, And when he, being Jesus, was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. So we see now, we jump ahead 10 years. There we covered 10 years of the life of Jesus. Bam. And Luke was the only one to cover that time period. You say, well, a lot happened during that time period. Yes, Jesus grew up. <laughs> Jesus grew up during that time period. And we'll see about that. Here they, here they're, 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 we see he was 12 years old. There's, there's several stages of childhood that are marked as follows. So during that time period, between then and 12 years old, at three years of age, the boys are weaned. They wore for the first time, uh, they wore the fur for the first time, fringed or tassel garments. And their education began at first under the mother's care. So the mothers trained the children at three years old. At five years old, uh, they were brought to learn the law. At first, they were learned by extracts written on scrolls of more important passages. In other words, similar to our Sunday school. If you go to Sunday school, we don't teach them the meat of it at five years old, but we start teaching them the fundamentals. We teach them the fundamental stories of the Bible so that they know the stories of the Bible. They can understand applications. And then at 12 years old, at 12 years old, it becomes more directly responsible for his obedience to the law. And finally, at 13 years old, is the first time that the, the Jewish boys put on their phylacteries, which were worn at the recitals of his daily prayer. They put these official manly garments that they do for worship. And it's possible now, interesting enough, it is possible, and some scholars believe this, that, that Jesus, when Jesus went to the Passover, this was also the time of his birth. So he would celebrate his birthday. So it's possible that he arrived in Jerusalem at 12 years old and celebrated his 13th birthday uh, uh, at during the Passover. You say, hold it, that's not in Christmas time. No, <laughs> we all know Jesus more than likely was not born in December. I, I hate to tell you that uh, because the Bible says the shepherds were tending their sheep in the fields. And they don't tend their sheep in December in the fields. It just doesn't happen that way. 
They're watching over the sheep in the spring of the year, so during the Passover season, no doubt. So uh, uh, we see here that uh, uh, that anyway that 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 they believe there's a good possibility that Jesus turned 13 during the Passover. That would be significant then. The reason why he came, because it says they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. Now, given that his parents attend the Passover every year. Jesus has surely made this journey with him, you would assume, several times. And you can imagine that a boy from a small Galilean town, how they would feel on a visit going to the big city of Jerusalem and this splendid temple. You know, it was an awesome event. But the term custom of the feast this time may have been different. So this time they mentioned Jesus was going, right? So it says, you remember the verse said, uh, and when he was 12 years old. Now, he didn't say this is the first time he came, but when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. So was the custom of the feast because Jesus was turning 12 years old? That's what they believe this verse means. That he, They went to the feast every year. They went to Jerusalem every year after the custom of the feast. But in this particular situation, Jesus turned 12 years old. And so therefore, there was a different custom for this feast because he turned 12 years old. So there were some ceremonies probably that took place with Jesus being 12 years old. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so verse 43. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned... The child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew it not. He says, when they have fulfilled the days as they return. So the Passover observance lasted for about eight days. Um, it lasted for about eight days. And uh, the uh, now, the pilgrims were not required to stay for the full eight days, but most people, if they travel that far, uh, went ahead and stayed for the full eight days. It says the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. So now you say, how can that be? Understand that uh, uh, people travel because of robbers. They didn't travel by themselves. Especially when they have small children and families. They travel together in these caravans. And they probably had a large number of crowd of family members traveling together. Men did tend to gra travel with other men, and the women travel with the women and the children. So that would be you'd have a group of men traveling on their own, talking, men talk, you know, and the women doing the women talk and watching the children. And so that's the way it was. And they would travel in kind of bands together. Uh, so the, And the children then would play together. So all the children were playing together, you know, could keep them occupied. Now, since Mary may have tra since Jesus traveled to Jerusalem as a child at twelve, and returned as an adult at thirteen, you know it's not difficult to imagine that he probably was with Mary on the trip over there, and Mary and Joseph may have thought that Joseph Mary may have thought that he was with Joseph on the way back, and Joseph may have just not thinking about it, thought, well, Joe Jesus is still traveling back with the other children because he plays with them. So it's really not surprising to know that they, they did not know him being there. And he says here, uh, and Joseph and his mother knew it not, knew not of it, because he stayed in Jerusalem. Now, uh, the, here's the deal is, the reason why you think, well, why were they looking for Jesus? Because understand, they did not have to question Jesus. Remember, he had always done what he was supposed to do. He was always where he was supposed to be. They had no reason whatsoever to worry about him at all. Um, it's interesting that Luke did not spend any time telling us what Jesus did during those three days that he was there in Jerusalem, how he survived for food or lodging. Because remember, Luke's purpose of telling the story was to let us know that Jesus as a boy even as a boy, he understood his unique identity and his mission. So, uh, 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 understand, don't be so critical of Mary and Joseph in this situation. How could a couple lose their children? Because they had a child they trusted 
You have a child, you trust your child to be where they are. And you don't say, well, I've heard people, I don't have to worry about them. They're going to be where they're supposed to be. They don't have to worry about, they're always going to be where they're supposed to be. I don't have to worry about them. They're not going to get in trouble. They're always going to do the right thing. I don't have to worry about that. But Jesus was one of those childs. And again, like I said, because they're two different caravans, no doubt they thought the way they thought. And why would they question it? Because Jesus would be where he was supposed to be. Verse 44. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, right? They, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey and sought him among their kinfolk and acquaintances. So now get this. They left Jerusalem in the two different bands and they traveled a day's journey. And when nighttime came, they set up their tents. You know, each family would set their tents up and they began looking for Jesus for bedtime. Probably to feed him supper or even Bible lessons because they taught their Bible, they taught their lessons to their children every day. So they may have, when nighttime came, it says, when, when the day's journey and they sought them among their kinfolk and their acquaintances. Because So we see this caravan had their family members and their friends. And they, they traveled a day's journey and set up the tent. And they couldn't find him. Now, as a parent, you know, you can imagine the range of feelings experienced by Joseph and Mary at this point in time. If your child was missing, you know, you must have been frightened. You're probably a little angry. What in the world? Why is it a year? You know, they, some of them, they're probably saying, you know, please God, please God, please God. And then all the other words might think, Boy, wait till I get my hands on him. You know, why is he not here? I don't know if that's the case. In that case, I, I read that. I don't know if that's true because I think they value Jesus. They didn't understand what happened here. But we'll see. They were somewhat agitated with Jesus when they get back. But they went out a day's journey, set up their tents, tried to find him, couldn't find him, and they came back. Verse 45. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. Now, they could not travel that night. You did not travel at nighttime. They didn't have lights and stuff to do it, so they had to wait till the next day. It said, when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. The slow journey back to Jerusalem, you can imagine, must have been torturous. Now, I'm guessing that they took their, their family members, went back to Jerusalem, I mean, continued on their journey home. They probably left their child, their other children with. Uh, they probably left their other children with the 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 other members of their family and travel back so that they would keep going forward and they could quicker come back to Jerusalem and start looking for Jesus. So I'm assuming that Mary. Now it's possible that others in their acquaintance may have also come back to look for Jesus. We don't know because there were family and acquaintances. I'm telling you, probably, there was probably some more people that went back with Joseph and Mary and not just Joseph and Mary to look for Jesus. That would make sense. The Bible doesn't say it. But again, let's use logic. They had a caravan of friends and families. And if I had a friend and family who needed my help, I probably would do that. Although, remember, they also got to get their family back home. They're limited resources. So, you know, either way, verse 46 comes around. And it came to pass after three days, they found him in the temple. Now, we don't know whether the return trip was part of the three days or not. It could be that they came back to Jerusalem a day and spent three days looking for him. I don't believe that was the case. I believe after three days was that after three days of finding him missing. So after three days, after the one day that they traveled away from Jerusalem, then the one day traveling back, I believe when they came back, they found him. I don't believe they spent days and days searching for Jesus, but I believe they traveled up there one day. They traveled back. When they got back, it was dark. They couldn't look for Jesus in darkness. And I believe on the third day, they began looking for Jesus and they found him. Because I don't believe it was that difficult to find him. But you know, I think because God's going to direct them to them. But, but they were going to walk, retrace the steps where they thought he would be. And that's where he would have been. So he says, uh, uh, now Luke used the phrase uh, three days here. That's the only time he uses the phrase three days. When we're talking about the resurrection, he says on the third day. So see, that was three days that Jesus was in the tomb. That's why we say three days 
Really, he's probably referring the entire time period from the time that they left Jerusalem, came back to Jerusalem, and found him. Okay, now where did they find him? It says, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. <coughs> so we see that uh, uh, Jesus was sitting. Now, some people make too much of this because they think that, the remember, instructor, teachers sat. And that was a teaching. Teaching position was a sitting position. But students can also sit. And Jesus, being a 12-year-old, uh, probably got tireder than others and was probably sitting because he was there a long time. He had been there now for three days. This was his third day sitting there listening and asking questions. It is probably that Jesus was not teaching these people anything, but he was listening and asking questions. You know, as a teacher, I, you know, I love to see students ask the right questions. People say there's nothing as a stupid question. No, there are stupid questions. Some people ask questions because they know they're stupid questions just to try to get a response. Jesus was asking sincere questions that was thought-provoking, that showed his grasp of the knowledge. And that's what teachers like to hear. They like the people have ask a question so that they know, you know, I took a test one time when I was working on a degree in uh, engineering technology at North at University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And the instructor was really a poor instructor. He was a poor instructor. And uh, we went through and did the material. We studied. I thought I was prepared. I had all the material. And I took the test. I made a 42. A 42. And I thought I was prepared for the test. So I said, you know what that taught me? That showed me I did not even know enough to know I didn't know what I knew. That's pretty bad, isn't it? I did not even know enough to know I didn't know what I know. Well, see, the case here, Jesus knew enough. The, 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 the people listening, they knew Jesus understood their answers because the questions that he asked made logical sense and showed him knowledge. So they rejoiced at finding a student who could ask good questions. Uh, verse 47. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. All that heard him. Not just the teacher. They were amazed that this child was understanding the questions. So now Luke establishes that Jesus, even as a child here, demonstrated the promise that will blossom into the reality of the wisdom. You know, later people will praise Jesus for his teaching in the synagogue in Luke chapter 4, 4 verse 15. Uh, they were amazed at the gracious words out of his mouth as this local boy in verse chapter 4, verse 22. They were astonished at his teaching and his authority in chapter 4, verse 32. Jesus opens the disciples' mind to understanding the scriptures in chapter, Luke chapter 24. See, Jesus understood these things because he sought God's word. Yes, he already had these knowledge. But remember, he put upon himself the image of a man. And so Jesus needed to learn like a man so that he could demonstrate that if you get the knowledge like a man, you don't have to be God to understand God's word. You hear me? So Jesus could not take his knowledge. He had to temporarily set aside his omniscience. All right, his all-knowingness, and had to learn like a man to make sure that he could gain the information like everybody else does. He had to go through the process to demonstrate that he could gain that information, and he did. So he went and searched the Scriptures. He read the Scriptures. He learned that way, already knowing it, but, not, but setting that aside. How did he do it? I don't know how he does it. But we already talked about the Trinity. Go back to one of the previous sessions on the Trinity, and you'll see that. But he set aside his omniscience so that he could gain that knowledge. And so he asked, and he sought. And Jesus demonstrated that what Jesus knew and the strength that he knew, we could do ourselves if we get into his word. Jesus gave us an example to follow. Question and answering, by the way, were staple Jewish teaching styles. You know, they, that's, that was their teaching style. They were amazed to hear such good questions and answers from a 12-year-old boy. Verse 48. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. So they saw they were amazed. The people who heard Jesus were amazed at his wisdom. 
But Mary and Joseph were astonished at his lack of consideration of their feelings. See, instead of being amazed at Jesus' knowledge and what he was doing, they looked at themselves. Instead of being amazed at what God can do, sometimes we look at our problems, how it affects us. Joseph and Mary were astonished at his lack of consideration. He said, his mother said to him, now, the gospel presents Joseph, you know, as a man of action, but it's interesting in this situation, Joseph doesn't have any words to say. None. Mary's the only one that says anything. It is possible that Joseph did say something, but remember, Luke was talking to Mary, and Joseph was already dead at the time Luke is getting this story from Mary, so Mary's telling him what she said. So it's possible Joseph had a conversation too. We just don't have that because Luke talked to Mary. So we can't really understand, you know, we can't say that Joseph didn't have anything to say. We just simply say that Mary was the one that we have quoted here. And she says, Son, why hast thou dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. Mary's question only hints at the anguish that she must have felt when she discovered that Jesus was missing. She concerned herself about Jesus, her heartache for her son. She said, Don't you care about how you hurt us? Also, you can imagine the shame, the family. Look, these people can't even keep up with their own children. That's terrible. That is terrible. The shame that it brought to the family. Verse 49. And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Wished ye not that I must be about my father's business? He said to him, How is it that you sought me? These are the first words, by the way, written in the Bible that Jesus spoke. The first word Jesus says to anybody is, How is it that we have recorded? How is it that ye sought me? You know, why is it you don't understand who I am is what he's saying. Uh, why is it you're looking for me, not knowing where I am? Why is it that you couldn't know where I was at? Interesting enough, in the open tomb, the angel uses the same verb to ask the question, why do you look for the living among the dead? In other words, why don't you understand? So Jesus simply asked to Mary and said, why don't you understand what I'm doing? Why don't you understand why I'm here? I, I don't understand. I don't understand why you don't understand. See, in both cases, the sense Jesus constitutes a deeper reality. Jesus constitutes a deeper reality that anyone around him could comprehend. People around him didn't understand who he was. They didn't know who Jesus is. Mary and Joseph had forgotten who Jesus was. And Jesus said, I'm surprised. I'm surprised. I didn't do this to hurt you. I'm surprised you didn't know what I was doing and why I was doing it. Uh, you know, you've taught me at home and you've gained a lot of information. I appreciate that. But these are scholars in the Bible. These are people who can show me things that I don't know, that I need to learn. And I'm trying to gain that information. And he said, was she not that I must be about my father's business? The verse can, reveals the central purpose of his story. And that was to acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God. Remember, this was a fact that was told Mary by the angel in Luke 1.35. And, and, and so Jesus is surprised that Mary and Joseph don't remember who he is. That he must be about his father's business. He did not come to be a child of Mary and Joseph. He came to to be the Son of God, to save the world from their sins, to be the Messiah. Jesus will use the word must. He said, I must be. Jesus used the must repeatedly about his obligations. What must he do? Luke 4, 33 says, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore I am sent. Luke 9, 22 saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things. Luke 13, 33 says, Nevertheless, I walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. He said, no, I must walk today. Luke 17, 25 says, but first must he suffer many things. See, there were several musts that must be done, and one of the must is that Jesus said is, I must be about my father's business. Now, interesting enough that Jesus was so easily pulled the title father from Joseph and switches it to God. 
They knew at that point in time that Jesus knew who he was. This is important. Some scholars use the verse 49 as a rebuke to his parents. I don't think that's the case. Uh, uh, I don't think that he, because he immediately submits himself to them. I think that Jesus is surprised rather than reproachful at Mary's question. I think he, he shows, he demonstrates his surprise that they are not supportive of what he's doing. And why would they be surprised he was there? And I think he's somewhat, uh, maybe not surprised, more disappointed. I always say you can't surprise God, you can disappoint him. I think Mary, I think Jesus was somewhat disappointed that they didn't understand who he was and what he must be about. Verse 50, And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them, Luke 1, 32, 33 says, And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give him the throne of his father, David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom shall, shall be no end. Remember, this is what Gabriel told Mary. So why wouldn't they understand that? However, Mary does not have our advantages, right? I mean, we know the whole scripture. So we can't be critical of her. Uh, remember, Jesus did not demonstrate the Messiah that they thought was coming. You know, they didn't understand that. So her awakening of the understanding of Jesus will come painfully. But Mary at this point, Mary and Joseph knows at this point that Jesus knows who he is. And no doubt they no longer question him about what he does. So then after the temple and until his baptism, we're, we're finished with the temple. Now what happens? So what happens now? Now we're going to see what happens. Luke 2.51 says, And he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and was subject unto them, but his mother kept all these things hard. Jesus leaves the temple and submits himself to Mary and Joseph and grows up to be a man. No more of his youth is spoken of in the scripture. That means from today we saw Jesus from three years old until 30 years old. Three years old to 30 years old. Nothing we have recorded in the scripture at all again until his baptism. Nothing. So Jesus goes down. He submits himself to them. He realizes they don't understand his objectives. They don't understand what he's supposed to do. So he submits himself to them. So next week, we're going to look at the baptism of Jesus and why this is important. I know it's a long lesson today, but we got to our baptism for next week. And we'll look forward to it. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity we have. We can come. We can worship you. I thank you so much for this powerful message about who Jesus is. Help us, Lord, to understand and see that Jesus had to be about God's business. Jesus put himself as a man and showed us how we need to learn, ask questions, study the word, go to those who know it so that we can understand it ourselves, so that then we can share it with others. We must do those things. Lord, help us to be the parents that our children need so that they grow up serving you and are successful in the life that you give them to have, that they might share it with others. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I thank you for your time, for your attention today, and uh, I pray that uh, you have a great day in the Lord. And if you're not serving God like you ought to, I pray you start doing it today.